This video is the second in a two-part series on modeling the seismic response of a channel system. In part one, we were able, through the use of waveform classification, to validate that our seismic volume does indeed detect the presence of the channel complex, and we were able to map its lateral extents. Now we want to take what we learned in that exercise and see if we can map the distribution of channel thickness. The specific transform technologies that will be employed in this workflow are subsetting the full seismic volume in aerial and zonal uh, extent, use horizon histograms to determine the vertical zone, spectral analysis of this new volume and subsequent spectral decomposition, RGB volume prisms where the R red, green, and blue components are assigned different frequencies, seismic data analysis with correlation table, and then multicollinearity analysis. Generate a 3D categorical model using k-means classification and facies assignment. And finally, generate the 3D geobody of the primary channel complex and then the associated top, base, and thickness maps. Part 1 concluded with the creation of a map of the facies distribution of the channel in yellow, other sands such as splays in orange, and background silts in brown. Let's put this solution away and begin the process of determining the three-dimensionality of the channel. To avoid more processing time than is necessary, we will subset the seismic volume to include only the channel system as defined by the inline and crossline ranges determined in part one, and to the time window defined by the top and base horizons used in the final waveform classification. First, we'll examine the shallowest time of the upper horizon, that was the negative peak minus 40 milliseconds, and the deepest time of the lower horizon, the negative peak plus 100 milliseconds. This is easily done by generating histograms for the two horizons respectively using the horizon data analysis tool. This is the distribution of time values for the upper horizon. We see that the minimum time is about 1730 milliseconds. Now we create a histogram for the lower horizon. The maximum time here for the lower horizon is about 1980 milliseconds. So we'll limit the subsetted volume to 1700 to 2000 milliseconds. As we observe from the waveform classification results, the channel complex ranges 80 to 280 for inlines and 100 to 330 for crosslines. Subsetting the original seismic volume to this reduced volume simply requires specifying the desired ranges in inline, crossline, and time. We are changing both the aerial and the vertical sampling. The inlines will go from 80 to 280. Cross lines 100 to 330, and the time window from 1700 to 2000 milliseconds. Let's go ahead and display this new volume as a volume prism and stretch the volume to its full extent. Because the waveform classification based on variation and seismic response clearly shows the detection of the channel, this is highly suggestive that the channel geometry in 3D may be defined by the spectral content of these spatially different seismic responses. Let's first start by examining the spectral content or the seismic bandwidth of the prism that we've created. Here we're displaying an ensemble power spectrum, which we can change to an amplitude spectrum, and then look for the low frequency and the high frequency contained within that band. Here we see it's from about 8 hertz to about 50 hertz. This will define the frequency range that we will wish to use in spectral decomposition. Simple matter then of going ahead and specifying the beginning and the ending frequency, and then how often we wish to be sampling the uh, spectral content, in this case 2 Hz. Go ahead and uh, simply apply it, run the spectral decomposition, and then we will be ready to use this for uh, identifying our channel using classification methods.
powerful visualization tool we can employ when analyzing or visualizing spectral decomposition results is to co-render the three color components, red, green, and blue, with three different frequencies. We'll remove the two prisms that we have there, leaving our uh, RGB display that we can now, in a straddle slice uh, prism, move up and down, which clearly shows the channel geometry. This is strong supporting evidence that subsequent statistical classification techniques should very nicely image this channel. Let's go ahead and actually do those processes. We're going to spawn the data analysis for seismic off of the volume and go in and take a look at all of the those frequency slices or frequency volumes that we created in the spectral decomposition. Here I'm going to create a correlation table of all of them, which is nothing more than a pairwise set of correlations. The diagonals going down you can see are one, and as we move off the diagonals they're far less than one. That implies that there's a lot of redundancy, linear redundancy in these volumes, and by running the multicollinearity I can see at a level of 0.7 it wants to retain three of the frequency slices. If I change this to 0.75 it wants to retain four. This should be more than sufficient for uh, picking up the information contained uh, across the spectrum of frequencies. The k-means classification I'm going to run from three classes to four classes where here the objective is to find the center of those clusters that are as far apart as possible uh, while at the same time the points that are assigned to that cluster create the smallest cloud as possible. Let's go ahead and bring up our seismic cube so that we can visualize what each of these classes looks like. We'll set it off to the side and now we'll go through each one and see where those classes reside within the volume. Shown in blue are the seismic samples that correspond to class number one. Here, class number two and finally class number three. Now in class number three we can see that it represents our channel class with some extra stuff involved. We also ran a solution with four and the hope is, is that four will better define the channel. Again, here is class one which now is the channel very nicely showing us. So let's go ahead and actually assign some facies to this. I've predefined these ahead of time, same ones that we used in the waveform classification. So for one, we're going to go ahead and assign that to our A channel, or our channel complex. The second one, we know are the sands, either marginal channel sands or some of the overbank sands, and we're going to go ahead and color those orange. Now, unlike what we had before, because we have four uh, facies, we're going to go ahead and also color this one the same, which we can do. So we're basically combining two and three at this point. And finally, we'll take four, which represents, shown here, our overbank deposits. Now at this point, let's go ahead and save this model and apply it to our seismic volume to create an actual seismic volume that represents the numbers uh, one through four, each one of those corresponding to the facies assignments that we made. We can now exit from the multivariate analysis and go to our seismic calculator, which will allow us to um, apply the statistical model that we just created to that prism. We'll go ahead and select that uh, bend grid and now walk in and pick up in the calculator under MV stats the model that we just created, our seismic facies. Now we can see here it's been defined by the four frequencies, 8, 16, 26, and 50, and it has picked up those actual vo um, frequency volumes from the data. At this point it becomes a simple matter of naming it and going ahead and creating it. Let's take a look at what we just created. We're going to go ahead and create a volume prism in our 3D view, pick up our categorical seismic categorical volume, stretch it out to its full extent, 
and now we can go in and begin to remove some of the faces that we're not interested in, in looking at. So here we're going to go ahead and turn off 2, 3, and 4, leaving only class 1, which is our channel faces. Now the next step is to go ahead and create our geobody. Simple matter of clicking on one of the cells in the channel, giving it a name, defining the number of pixel faces that we wish to consider a connection, since this is going to be a connected geobody, and letting it run. Now we can see that that main channel is all connected. The small yellow pieces that we see off to the side are not connected to the main channel. We have our geobody, and that geobody has three dimensions. We've in essence put a convex hull around all the points that have the connection geometry that we asked for. Now the final step is to go ahead and create uh, a, the thickness map from it. So the first thing we'll do is just isolate the geobody. We'll remove the prism. The geobody has a context menu that goes along with it. And the very top one says, create the geobody thickness. The geobody is actually defined by, into a tra travel time, because that's what our seismic data is. So if we had a velocity model, we could go ahead and use it. We don't here. So I'm going to go ahead and assign 7,500 feet per second as the interval velocity, or half of that for two-way travel time. The channel geobody is now defined by a top time surface, a base time surface, the corresponding time isochron, and using the velocity we specified, an actual thickness. Let's go ahead and bring back our base map. Here you can see this is where we started the both parts. Let's show you the results of part one, which is our facies distribution map from waveform classification. We see the channel geometry in the yellow quite nicely, and the objective here was to bring three-dimensionality to it. So we're going to bring in the thickness map from our geobody. I'm going to change the color scale to a gray to yellow. Let's reverse that, where yellow is the thickest and gray is the thinnest, and overlay it on top of our waveform classification solution. You see that, in fact, the channel geometry is very well delineated, but now we have the three-dimensionality in the thickness. I thank you for your attention.